So people tend to, they think they can activate their pelvic floor by stopping the flow of urine, um, of pee as well as, as they're urinating. And that's definitely the wrong thing to do. You can use it to identify the pelvic floor, but not to retrain the pelvic floor. And essentially what you're doing is you're sending mixed messaging because as your, as your pelvic floor should be relaxing so that you can void and urinate, you're tensing up the pelvic floor. So it's kind of sending that mixed messaging to the brain and that in itself can create at the start of a, of a situation or a dysfunction. Pelvic floor dysfunction is one of the most underdiagnosed root causes of conditions that include urinary incontinence, constipation, sexual dysfunction, back pain, and irritable bowel syndrome. How can we do better at identifying and treating pelvic floor dysfunction? Today, we have two amazing doctors of physical therapy, Dr. Miriam Graham and Dr. Reshma Rathod. They're here to help us understand how, how the pelvic floor impacts our entire body health. We know from functional medicine that, in fact, the entire body is connected. It's just that the pelvic floor often gets kind of under the radar, so to speak, and ignored. Today, we have an enlightening conversation about pelvic floor function, how to tell if you might have pelvic floor dysfunction, and what doctors Miriam and Reshma do as physical therapy doctors to help their patients actually achieve optimal pelvic floor function. I am Dr. Andrew Wong, co-founder of Capital Integrative Health, which is a clinic, community, and movement focused on root cause healthcare transformation. The Capital Integrative Health podcast is dedicated to transforming the consciousness around what it means to be healthy and understanding the root causes of both disease and wellness. If you are someone who has struggled with constipation, urinary incontinence, sexual dysfunction or pain or have irritable bowel syndrome, don't miss this conversation. Thank you so much, Miriam Reshma, for coming today to our podcast. Welcome. And uh, we're so glad you're here. Thank you. Thanks Great for to be us. here. So we are talking today about pelvic floor uh, therapy, a type of physical therapy. But as I think we talked about before we started recording, this is really part of physical therapy, part of, you know, whole body assessment. Let's kind of talk first, though, about kind of both of your backgrounds. You know, we've known each other for a long time. You're here locally in, in Rockville, I own a practice for Storm Motion, which has been open, which I just realized for 18 years, which is amazing. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, would love to just hear your stories, both of your stories about what inspired you both to become physical therapists and specifically kind of working on um, maybe pelvic floor as well as part of your practice. Yeah. Um, do you want to go first or do you want me to go first, Miriam? You go ahead. Go ahead. So I, um, physical therapy, you know, I knew I wanted to be in the healthcare environment and you did, um, I was officially a candy striper in high school and explored different options of, um, you know, different healthcare professions and uh, physical therapy definitely um, interested me, but I wasn't quite sure exactly what I wanted to do. And then I took one of those prof those occupational tests in, um, in middle school or high school. And the three options were a teacher, a hairdresser, or a physical therapist. So I decided to go on the physical therapy route and um, did some observation hours. You had to do some observation time uh, to apply to graduate school. And um, so really decided that's what I wanted to do. And, um, you know, I tell my daughters, that my, I think I'm kind of more of the anomaly where I knew from high school, this is what I wanted to do. I kind of went straight and narrow through um, college and grad school. And I'm still in my profession, you know, I'm practicing my profession and I enjoy my profession um, and with what I do. So, you know, my, um, I've evolved from, uh, I started often with uh, working with those with stroke injury and brain injury rehab to musculoskeletal disorders. Um, and then, uh, and then honestly, I think I was bribed by my supervisor at the, at the National Rehab Hospital to start specializing into the pelvic floor. And I resisted and resisted and resisted until uh, she, she said, you know, um, she will act, they would actually pay for me to go to this course. And I thought, well, it doesn't hurt to go and, and learn something new. And I uh, went to this one course and definitely felt that was the missing link to the, the treatments that I was doing for the back and the hips and, and the legs. 
Um, so yeah, so that's the that's my journey into the pelvic floor arena, and I feel like we've helped out many, many, many people in this area. Yeah, yeah. Um, before we get to to Miriam's story, I'm curious about sort of traditional PT school. Is it really emphasized very much in their pelvic floor therapy in terms of like how it's connected to the rest of the body? Not so when we were we there. To school, no, I don't think it was even addressed when we went to school. When we went to school, the SI joint didn't move, or that's what they told us. Um, and then, uh, but now, actually, both Miriam and I have been adjunct um, professors at local universities, and we've done um, lecture series on the pelvic floor. So you're changing the education, which is great. You know, absolutely. For the, for yeah. the next generation of yeah, Absolutely. Awesome. We're also, well, Restore Motion is also an approved um, uh, educational site for internships for doctorate physical therapy students. So those students that want to specialize in the pelvic floor, pelvic floor physical therapy, they can actually come to our site um, through their university for credit. Um, uh, it's almost like a residency or an okay. internship experience um, so that they can actually learn a little bit, more, uh, get hands-on training. That's good to know. Is that after they get their DPT or or before? It's in like process. In process. In process. Yeah. 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 They've had all the didactic work, and now this is yeah. uh, their clinical work experience. To really learn it. Yeah, that's awesome. That's so great. Great to know that you're you guys are a site. Uh, so, Miriam, what's your story of how you became a physical therapist? So, um, kind of the polar opposite of Reshma. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had been studying ballet and uh, went uh, half day to ballet, Washington Ballet, and half day to high school. And then when I graduated from high school, I continued dancing and ended up doing about a four year gap year uh, with musical theater. Um, during that time, I realized that dance I loved, but I didn't see it as a long-term situation. So when everybody else was graduating college, I started at 22 and did prerequisite work um, at University of Maryland and then transferred to Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia for a um, master's in physical therapy. And that's where I met Reshma. It was first day of orientation and um, we were cadaver buddies and we figured if we could do that, then we could uh, just about do anything. Um, as Reshma said earlier, we both worked at uh, the National Rehabilitation Hospital for about 10 years. And um, it, during that time, uh, one of our influences, we did um, work in osteopathic manipulation through Michigan State College of Osteopathic Medicine. And that really looks at you know, the whole body, the integrative system, um, of how the body framework works together. And through that, um, it was very eye-opening. It, it's right in keeping with integrative medicine. Um, much like Reshma, um, my supervisor said to me, well, you know, uh, we really need someone to go do this course. And I actually didn't know what was gonna happen. So I'm like, okay, I'll do a course. Uh, and then I realized uh, with the pelvic floor, um, it was so much more um, than I had uh, realized before. And as we were saying before the recording started, this idea of the pelvic floor being a functional set of musculature that helps facilitate load transfer from the legs to the core and from the you know, super incumbent weight of the body down on the pelvic floor, it's just a hub of activity. So, you know, we're familiar with elimination and childbirth and sexual function, but the mechanical piece of pelvic floor is what really applies to everyone, regardless of their um, condition or um, health. Yes, and, and we know that, you know, um, at least traditionally, I always thought of like pelvic floor therapy being mostly for women, but really every you know, men and women, you know, every, every body has a pelvis, right? I mean, really connect. That's exactly upper right. Upper and lower yeah, body. And we're even seeing pediatric, the pediatric population here now. Okay. Um, okay. Those that are address, you know, having issues with constipation and we're starting to see a handful of um, the transgender population as well. Yeah. Because yeah. everyone, I guess so we you talked said, about everyone has what... the pelvic floor. 
Right, right. So, so the pelvic floor is, uh, let's kind of maybe more formally or, or um, just basically define what the pelvic floor is. We already talked about why it's important. What is the pelvic floor and how, how do you assess the pelvic floor function? So the general, pelvic floor is a, is a group of muscles that are in the floor of the pelvis. So if you think of sitting on a saddle, anything that's touching the saddle kind of in that central area is going to be the pelvic floor. It's between the two sit bones side to side, the pubic bone in the front and the tailbone or the coccyx bone in the back. And these uh, muscles work together with helper muscles in the hips. Um, so the inner thighs, the hip rotators, the buttock muscles, um, those helper muscles uh, can either facilitate pelvic floor function or make it more difficult. So um, in folks maybe who have pelvic pain, um, one of the culprits might be um, tight inner thigh muscles, tight adductors, or uh, dysfunction in the hip rotator muscles uh, that contributes to that. Um, so that thinking of that saddle area, that's the pelvic floor. They're also um, talked about as a group of uh, the levator ani. There are three groups, uh, three muscles that make up the levator ani group. And they will, um, when contracting, close off openings. And when they release, they can allow passage through the uh, pelvic floor openings. We're talking about and those openings. Would, yeah. yeah, yeah, they would be uh, the openings would be the urethra, female vagina, and a um, uh, anus to allow for passage of stool. If the levator ani is not working that well, what kind of conditions are, are you seeing in those situations? Uh, so constipation, we want, I guess, but but other ones too, right? Sometimes just pain, pelvic tension. Hmm. So often um, in the female population, if the levator ani is tight, they could um, have difficulty voiding because it's um, urinating. It, it, the, the pelvic floor muscles are just so tense that they have a hard time relaxing. Um, sometimes the pain with penetration. So sometimes even a gynecological exam, a tampon insertion, or any sort of sexual activity could um, contribute to that pain and discomfort. Yeah, yeah. Um, and other, other signs besides with levator ani, what are some other signs of pelvic floor dysfunction that, that you see in clinical practice? So when people are having to urinate um, frequently and um, you know people may be aware that as men age, the prostate enlarges and so men have to um, void more frequently because they're not able to efficiently void because of that, but also um, you know, pelvic floor dysfunction will show up with uh, increased urinary frequency or urgency. Um, and that can be very limiting for people because, um, you know, think about getting on the beltway, you know, you never know what you're going to get. So, um, you know, or being able to sit through a meal or go to a movie um, things like that. Um, another um, issue that happens with um, women uh, more than men is uh, pelvic organ prolapse. And this is where the organs that are suspended within the uh, pelvis, the, the uterus or the rectum or the bladder can um, start to slide down um, and uh, get in the way of pelvic floor function. And, and the mus the organs that slide down, like the, like you said, they, they slide down because of the pelvic floor dysfunction, or is there some other reason? Well, in say someone who's had um, multiple pregnancies and, and deliveries, okay. they might have um, laxity in the tissue and weakness in those muscles, and that's happening. It could happen in someone who maybe has um, uh, hypermobility and say they just don't have the connective tissue um, strength to maintain. Right. It can also happen with folks who have poor toileting habits. Maybe they've had years of constipation and they've been straining at stool. And so they've been 
over time uh, stretching out those muscles because of poor function. They're not using the pelvic floor to eliminate efficiently. So they're stretching out those supporting structures in that musculature. Mm -hmm. um, you also, I think, talked about how, how the hip muscles, the buttock muscles, um, you know, the, the core, they're all related to the pelvic floor. Do you also see the opposite where you can, someone can have sort of a lower abdominal pain or, or hip tightness or, or even back pain as a result of pelvic floor dysfunction? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's a, you know, one affects, one affects the other, right? Yeah. It's like yeah. the body being a continuous unit. Mm -hmm. So often um, if there's tension in the hip muscles, we might become suspicious of a weak pelvic floor. If they're, um, if they're complaining of pelvic floor symptoms, only because if the pelvic floor muscles are weak, then the, the surrounding muscles, the, the, the muscles that want to help, the helper muscles, will increase it in their tension to, to support that weakness and vice versa. Yeah. Well, how, do you, how do you assess, say, the function of the muscles of the pelvic floor versus, say, the, the fascia, you know, the connective tissue? Is, is there a way to differentiate that in terms of what's going on with the person? Yeah, so there's definitely some objective measures that we could um, we could use and implement. One would be um, taking a look at the the strength of the pelvic floor and differentiating it between the pelvic floor and the and the hip muscles or the back muscles. Um, so we're able to identify and isolate those muscles. Um, here at Restore Motion, we have a dynamic ultrasound machine, and so we're able to visually see how those muscles are re being recruited and we were able to identify the pelvic floor muscles versus any of the other surrounding muscles too and to see how those muscles are um are activating and we'll and and in, the, in that situation we'll be able to see if it's a, a maybe a fascial restriction or a delay in muscle contraction as well that's um, awesome so dynamic ultrasound machine meaning that you're you're the person's on the table on the exam table they're contracting or relaxing different muscles and you can see in real time what's going on, whether it's a muscle or, or fascial release issue. Uh, yep, yep. That's and then we also use our general like osteopathic um, uh, exam, uh, examination tools that we have just through palpation, um, just uh, through range of motion, uh, strength testing, mobility testing. Mm -hmm. Um, and you treat both, you said kids, but also also men, women, transgender. Um, what do people need to know about, about going to see, let's say they're gonna go to see one of you or one of your staff at Risk for Motion, what, what kind of things would they expect with, with say pelvic floor therapy? Is there, is there internal work going on? I mean, I think just what, what do people, what should people expect? Yeah, I feel like, you know, people are very, very nervous coming in uh, for physical therapy because I don't think they understand of pelvic floor physical therapy. Right, right, We're used right. To seeing the yeah. traditional aspect of, um, you know, we have six private rooms here at Restore Motion to address your needs. Um, we're, you know, it's always warm and comfortable and we want to hear their story. We want to hear their story. Um, you don't need to have an internal exam at the very first visit. Often what we try to do is take a look at the, bi the biomechanics and where are the, where are the faulty aspects of their biomechanics. And that when I mean biomechanics, it's again, talking about the mobility, the strength, the, the, the mechanics of your joints. And then if needed, then there would be a discussion if um, an internal exam is applicable or not. And it can be done day one, or it could be done um, during, as a subsequent treatment session. Mm -hmm. Great. That's great to know uh, for all listeners out there. Um, you know, and I'd like to question. just, I'd, oh, yes. Andy, I'd just like to elaborate on that. Um, it is very important that listeners know that at Restore Motion, it is not a one size fits all for the exam. You know, we really want to tailor what we look at and when we do it um, based on that person's history. You know, some people um, have history of abuse or other issues surrounding the pelvic floor. And we understand that it's a very, um, I guess, emotionally charged area. And so we really focus on approaching that with respect 
in partnership with the patient and the patient's physician. So we really do strive for a teamwork approach to make sure that everything is on, you know, all people are on board. And with this, you know, I've worked with both, um, and I, Reshma and the staff has worked too with um, the, the physician uh, ordering the treatment as well as um, sometimes mental health providers, uh, family members, um, we can provide as much support um, because ultimately it's the patient that gets better. You know, we're there for an hour, maybe once a week. And so we really want to empower people in a way that they feel most comfortable um, moving through um, this kind of dysfunction. That's a great point, Miriam, just, uh, just to kind of understand that, like you said, it's a partnership. It's like trying to create a safe environment, um, a personalized environment where it's really looking at the individual and what they need as opposed to like more of a cookie cutter approach. That's, that's really great. Yeah. Um, speaking of more of an individualized approach, it, it might be nice just to kind of bring it to life for our listeners. Um, maybe if you have a sample sort of case of, you know, someone that, you know, who, who would someone, uh, you know, who would consider pelvic PT and like what, how long would that treatment be and that kind of thing? How would you kind of walk through it with someone um, so what are the kind of common conditions you would consider for, for pelvic PT and sort of maybe like how long and, you know, those type of things would they need to be treated? I think that if you look at it in terms of stories, you know, we've, we've, we've said that everybody with a pelvis is, is a possible candidate for pelvic PT. So I think if, you know, we start with um, say um, an 11 year old boy, okay. Um, maybe too busy to go to the bathroom, got other things to do, um, held a stool, and then it hurts to go to the bathroom. It hurts to move his bowels. And so there's this avoidance cycle going on. Um, and, you know, the parents may or may not be aware, but then eventually they might, um, uh, be referred to us by their pediatrician or by a pediatric um, uh, gastroenterologist. And so really that first day is going to be education, understanding, assessment, finding out the, 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 the child's body awareness. Um, you know, with uh, during the pandemic, there was uh, homeschooling and um, not a lot of uh, getting out and playing. There's a lot of video activity. Um, there, there might not be as much uh, movement in general. Yeah. And um, the pelvic floor takes a while to fully differentiate in, in children. So um, that session, it might be understanding, you know, what a bowel program is to help facilitate consistency of stool to be able to pass. Um, working with the parent on charting progress uh, parent and, and child, and working on gross coordination, uh, physical activity, coordinating the legs and the trunk um, and the core uh, to be able to uh, facilitate movement. So, I mean, that might be four to six sessions um, of understanding there. It depends on how willing the, uh, the child is, uh, the parents are are open and um, really the participation, you know, is that team approach again. Mm -hmm. so that's you. one story. Yeah, uh, might wanna, let's, let's do one more. I think just having, maybe, maybe it's the, the, the child's mom, but um, like a 45 to 50 year old female, maybe perimenopause, menopause, how do hormones affect the pelvic floor and how would you treat someone like uh, this woman with maybe painful sex, you know, or uh, maybe they start getting vaginal dryness. Uh, maybe they're getting some other sort of pelvic pain, maybe interstitial cystitis, you know, all these different things. Um, we could list a lot of things, urinary incontinence, you know, maybe there's, there could be different things, but I, I, I'm curious because, you know, hormones is, is everyone's favorite topic. So just kind of understanding how hormones are affecting the pelvic floor, I think would be really helpful. So I think um, hormones definitely affect, you know, there's definitely a strong influence of hormones within the pelvic floor. And we're definitely, we're seeing a, a good population of those perimenopausal female 
Um, Miriam, what's the stats again with, um, with menopause? Five billion, five billion with a B women are going through menopause in the next five years. Isn't that crazy? So five billion people. Five, wow. Women, that's, women, 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 just women. Uh, that's, that's incredible. I, I just, that's it's, a lot. Wrap my, it's just hard to wrap my head around that, but yeah. yeah so we, we saw that set. We're like, wow, there's a lot of people that are, that are going to need our help. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, so what happens is when there's estrogen depletion, you have vaginal atrophy. So that's just the tissues around the vaginal area become uh, thinner. And that can lead to, um, it can lead to some pain issues um, the, uh, because of the vaginal dryness. Uh, you know, there could be some tension related to that. And in that case, we would address uh, working on the pelvic floor, sometimes internally, internally, sometimes externally, just to um, some, it, it could be a massage, it could be stretching, it could be some exercises um, to help improve the, the, the function of that. And in those cases, we also, we also try to improve the, just the, uh, the, what we call the length tension relationship of the muscle. So we want to have good tension, not too tight, but we also have, want to have good length and not you know, to, to generate that force that we want. Um, a lot of times when that length tension is off, that can also lead to um, incontinence, right? Some, some weakness. And so sometimes when just an abnormal pull to the muscle or ab, uh, can lead to the, the incontinence situation. So it's not to say that your muscles could be weak. Sometimes the muscles are weak. Um, and those are predominantly seen like like after childbirth or something like that. But usually for per perimenopausal, it's almost like a disuse, not a disuse, but it's just a general gradual um, uh, weakening or inhibition is what we like to call it. And sometimes um, improving core stability uh, would help with uh, so improving core stability would also help with addressing the whole aspect of that of the pelvic floor. So we're, you know, we could do some hands on uh, treatment in, with the manual therapy aspect of it, but then there's also the exercise based approach to to treatment. And depending on where that that person is and, 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 and their symptoms that could take anywhere from like three visits, but it could take as much as, you know, 10 or 12 visits, depending on the extent of their pain or their uh, dysfunction. Great. Um, you know, and then, while, while oh, go ahead. can I, can I just say yeah, for so. one of the uh, offerings that we have, there's a class that we take um, uh, for uh, up to four students for it. it's called floor of the core. And in this class, it's for anyone. You know, you could be a tennis player, a, a computer scientist, what have you. Um, and it goes over um, in four separate modules um, how to be able to address the core appropriately, incorporating pelvic floor. Um, so this is fully closed out in the open area of our office, and it's been very helpful for people because. As we said earlier, everybody has a pelvic floor and this is a way to make it accessible and um, open it up for um, ease of use. Mary, do you also wanna talk about the pelvic floor workshop? Cause that's um, you know, community outreach that we have for- Yeah, I guess we have three of those really. We have um, the uh, keeping, keeping it healthy your pelvic floor keeping it healthy, which is a course for, it's a free workshop that's done um, every other month uh, about pelvic floor function. Um, many of the participants have been female, but it's also open to males. Um, we have a, the prostate talk uh, lecture workshop, which is for um, uh, men who have prostate issues and want to make sure that they uh, don't let it run their life. Um, and that's offered uh, quarterly. And then again, every other month we have the um, Strong as a Mother, which is a peripartum postpartum course on pelvic floor. And again, all of these are free of charge. They're open for the community and it's uh, done by Zoom right now. It seems like people like the convenience of being to log on anywhere. All that's of that so information is on our website. 
Okay. I also wanted to share another case study, if that's okay, um, Andy. Absolutely. Because we've talked about the kids, we've talked about the um, perimenopausal female, but I also want people to realize that um, you don't have to be at the extreme of the range of age range, because we see plenty of active, um, and in this case, I'm going to say females, but males and females, uh, we've seen ballerinas, we've seen professional tennis players, professional soccer players come through. And in the case with the professional soccer player, she had reoccurrent hamstring strains. And so for about 16 months, she kept re restraining her hamstring and wasn't able to play professional soccer. Mm -hmm. And um, it turned out that it was actually her pelvic floor tension that was contributing to her chronic hamstring strain. So addressing her pelvic floor appropriately, you know, she was able to get back onto the field and, and perform and, you know, place for the national team. So it's just, it's just that addressing that, you know, a chronic situation, one aspect could be actually coming from somewhere else. And that's what was happening. Um, you know, she got plenty of treatment in those 16 months, but until her pelvic floor was really addressed, that's when she really started noticing the change. Yeah. I'm not a professional uh, athlete, but I definitely noticed when running that my, my left hamstring is chronically tight. So I'd love to hear your thoughts about how to address uh, tight hip flexors. This is kind of a tangent, but this is what happens in this podcast. So, um, you know, should I <laughs> yeah, yeah. look at the pelvic floor or should I do something with the hip? I'm just curious about, because um, everyone has tight hips, you know, everyone that I examine pretty much in, in my office has tight hips. And I feel like I have that too. Well, muscle balance is king. When you can get proper muscle balance, that length tension that Reshma was talking about, you're going to have improved function and Hip flexors are certainly um, easy game because we do a lot of sitting, but yeah. um, you know that that tension. Sometimes the tightness is also weak. You know, tightness yeah. and weakness go together. So um, yeah. Yeah. it really does take having somebody assess it to kind of help tease it out. It's frustrating when you know you're in the profession and you you know so much and then you can't figure it out on yourself. No, definitely can't. Uh, always have to go with <laughs> someone else. I, I would just say that in general, um, you know, the physical therapy approach you 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 and your staff take is is really great because you're really looking at how the whole body is connected, right? And that's where that's where it's not just about the hip or the pelvis, but it's about hip, pelvis, back, core, all the other muscles, my facial, how everything is connected, right? That sounds like which is kind of going back to integrative health and functional medicine, which is what we do here, right? It's sort of like the same philosophy of understanding the connections between the body. Absolutely. Um, so, I think that's so why if someone is coming in and, you know, wondering, yeah, exactly. Um, having a sense of, should I do physical therapy? Should I do pelvic floor or PT? I mean, it really sounds like anyone could get assessed at least to see if it's helpful for them if they have, say, a health issue or even trying to prevent things. Um, do you ever do like preventative consults if someone's just like, I just want to see how my pelvic floor is, you know, what the health is, kind of like a checkup, you know, I'm curious on that, on that, just, you know, you have an athlete or someone that's active, they, they might just want to know how they're doing, you know, how do you keep the pelvic floor healthy? How do you prevent pelvic floor dysfunction? You know, we know that this is going to be another cliche, but, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? So how do we become more proactive about these things to um, not only restore our emotion, but also to, you know, keep it, um, I had to throw your uh, company name in there yeah. as well. Keep it moving. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> keep it moving. Keep it moving. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, I don't think that we've had anybody just call up and say, hey, I'd like a pelvic floor assessment who didn't have symptoms. And I think that's partly because there's not the awareness of the, of the role of the pelvic floor in, um, as Rush was talking about, the biomechanical model of, uh, of, of function. So I think that um, it's, it's because of lack of um, awareness, but we do have folks who um, have seen us maybe graduate from physical therapy and then come back and say, hey, I just want to check up. I just want to make sure that I don't let anything get away from me. And we kind of like that dental model of, you know, come in just to make sure um, and we can tweak the exercises or the flexibility or, you know, kind of give some suggestions on, on that pathway to health. Um, 
but again, just just calling up to say, hey, can you check out my pelvic floor? I haven't. No one's that. running in for a pelvic exam, I guess. No one's yeah. running in Got for it. it. No. So yeah. I've actually had a few, a select few um, folks come in as a preventative, and only because it was a word of mouth referral. So the mom has come in because of an incontinence issue, and she's like, hey, can my daughter come in to check get things checked oh, okay. out? Or, you know, my, my daughter just delivered a baby and she doesn't, she's fine, but can she just get checked out? Yeah. So I think as, as one family member is learning more and more about their situation, they're sharing that information to a loved one. And then that loved one will come in for a quick check. And, you know, and it's great to have these preventative um, consults because, you know, you're making a difference. You know that you can actually start nipping things in the bud before they progress. So just giving some basic exercise, some basic, um, you know, education can go a long way. Education is empowerment. And I think that's one of the purposes of the podcast is, you know, you know, really empowering listeners, empowering the community to really understand how important in this case, the pelvic floor is and how it's connected to the rest of the body. What are your YouTube's top recommendations for keeping the pelvic floor healthy for someone that, you know, may or may not have pelvic floor issues, but just how do you keep it healthy over time, which I think you probably cover some in your classes, just to give people a preview. So, um, so I mean, I think the one thing is just to have awareness of the pelvic floor. There's many people out there that they have no idea that there's something between their back and their legs, right? And often it's it, it's a topic that they haven't really talked about or didn't they grew up or not talking about. Maybe it's about taboo it. or something right. like it's you know something like that. Yeah, yeah, it's like what there's pelvic floor. What is that? Like you know? genitalia are there, so I'm gonna like steer away from that. There's right. still muscles. Or they don't talk that. about that part. Yes. Um, right. And you know, and even in our school, it wasn't really talked about. And so mm -hmm. um, in our so I think just awareness and just having that connection and the mindset of that pelvic floor is a huge topic. And so once when people know how an understanding and they can have that mind body connection, I think that in itself um, is just the beginning. Um, often also people tend to, they think they can activate their pelvic floor by stopping the flow of urine, um, of pee as well as, as they're urinating. And that's definitely the wrong thing to do. You can use it to identify the pelvic floor, but not to retrain the pelvic floor. And essentially what you're doing is you're sending mixed messaging because as your, as your pelvic floor should be relaxing so that you can void and urinate, you're tensing up the pelvic floor. So it's kind of sending that mixed messaging to the brain and that in itself can create at the start of a, of a situation or a dysfunction, but to, um, to work on relaxing that, that pelvic floor is, is key. So strengthening is just as important as relaxing the pelvic floor. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like, okay, and I'm not muscle, ex balance. muscle balance. Okay. Uh, muscle yeah. balance, like making sure things are symmetrically even strength wise and maybe flexibility wise length tension on both sides. Is that what you mean? Yes, absolutely. Any, any yoga, uh, any yoga asanas or poses that you would recommend? I'm not an expert on yoga, but just, I just feel like, you know, a lot of yoga poses use, you know, uh, use the core and the pelvic floor muscles. So Miriam's the expert on that one. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So th <laughs> there, there is some research for um, folks that are having difficulty with their period, you know, uh, you know, pain, um, that triangle pose is helpful. Okay. Um, I think that, um, uh, one of the, the ones we give many people with pelvic tension is happy baby, um, yeah. and focus on diaphragmatic breathing during happy baby. Um, so again, things that involved, uh, inner thigh mobility and, um, gentle rotation of the torso can be very helpful. Great, great. Thank you so much. And then um, one, one more thing on pelvic floor. It was kind of a general question, but how often should we be, um, you know, moving around? So like, what's the maximum time you would think we should sit before we start getting up and moving our bodies since we're all kind of at a desk a lot of times or Zoom or different things, right? Yeah, since, um, since we know that this I is think, contributing to pelvic floor dysfunction. Right, right. There was a huge spike in people with pelvic pain first time during the pandemic when people were sitting at home and not commuting. Okay. So I'm a big fan of, um, you know, 25 minutes 
Um, you don't have to do a marathon, just get up, just change positions. You know, um, a lot of folks have the ability to either stand or, um, or, or sit at their desk. Um, that's really important. But I would say probably, if not the 25 minute mark um, every hour, just to get up and move. Yeah, keep keep active, keep moving. Yeah, that that sounds like a good, good, um, good advice. So so we've kind of talked a lot today about about pelvic floor health, how it's affecting the rest of the body. Thank you very much to both of you for uh, coming on today. We do have some closing questions that are typically very fun for our, our guests. If if you wouldn't mind both, uh, at, you know, just sharing your morning routine. We know that that's really helpful for health. A lot of times, it's kind of establishing. Kind of something you do every day to kind of get off the day, you know, get off to right the right start. Um, if you could uh, talk about that, if you wouldn't mind. So well, I'm a morning person. Yeah, I was so just... I'm going to go first. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, I usually wake up around five, um, sometimes before my alarm. I have a fantastic espresso maker. And I make one shot of half-calf espresso and I sit out on my porch and um, look at the sun and the deer and all of those little critters out there in the backyard and have my espresso. And uh, that's how I start my morning every day. Great, thank you for sharing. Mine's not, uh, mine's pretty boring. I am in the office at <laughs> seven o'clock a couple of days. So I wake up at, it's very difficult for me to wake up by 5.30 with an alarm, um, but I get myself ready, uh, pack my lunch. Um, I don't have coffee. I don't, I don't even think I have water. And, but I get in the car and I'm at the office by uh, 6.50. All so right, my, all right, my right. morning routine is a bit boring. <laughs> yeah, but both, both kind of getting up, activating your bodies a bit. Um, at least you're moving, you're, you're getting up a bit. Yes. Um, so no Netflix in the morning. It doesn't sound like anyway, no Netflix, no exercise on in the morning for me. So yeah. Yeah. Morning. What is one thing that you have both done that you think has, uh, maybe you can answer this individually, but that has changed your health for the better, the, the most, you know, whether it's movement or something else, you know, healthy practice, we can kind of have this idea of, you know, there's a lot of things that we can do to improve our health. Um, what have you both found to be really helpful for you? I grew up in ballet, as I said earlier, and um, went to Pilates and yoga, um, certified Pilates instructor and studied yoga for 20 years. But I think recently the thing that made a big change for me is I started lifting weights and I'm a certified kettlebell instructor now. Um, that's been huge. And then the other thing was um, I had a consultation for functional nutrition and that made a huge impact on my life going through um, menopause. So functional nutrition and lifting weights, I would say would be the most recent things that I've done that have impacted my health. Great, love it. Shout out for uh, kettlebells and resistance training. Absolutely. And, and functional nutrition. It's all connected, right? Oh, everything is all connected. Uh, thank you, Miriam. And uh, Reshma, how about you? you? Yeah, so I think um, I'm along the lines of like also some of the functional nutritional changes that I've been making, um, you know, just little subtle changes. I feel like makes a huge difference as your body changes, you know, I can't eat or drink what I used to in my 20s and 30s. <laughs> and, and now that I'm in my 50s, it, things are just a little different. So I just want to make sure I stay ahead of, um, of what I need to do to minimize any sort of uh, uh, family history, med like family medical history, medical, illnesses. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so that was my rationale for the, for the functional nutrition, uh, consult and changes. I okay. have also started, um, I do a little bit of running. So I try to run two, five Ks a week that, and I feel like that helps me with cardiovascularly. And I, um, also do a little bit of, uh, the, the, the weight lifting as, as well. Um, I also enjoy just, you know, having dinners and socialization with my family and fr friends and family, especially in these yeah. last couple of years where it's been so limited. Um, I'm definitely enjoying that a lot more now. Super help, helpful. Very, very important for, for health. Um, you know, opening up a bed, um, socializing more, connecting more. We know that's a big part of health. And mm -hmm. then the functional nutrition, since you both mentioned it, 
since it's so personalized, you know, nutritional needs and changes do change over time, you know, as we move through life. It's same with, I think, functional movement too, like, you know, movement, um, things to focus on might, might change over time as well, you know, so that's, that's so great. Thank you so much, both of you for coming on today to talk about PT, especially pelvic floor therapy and, you know, how to, how to basically keep the pelvic floor healthy. How can listeners learn more about, um, you guys, your practice, work with you, if you want to just kind of give a shout out to your um, practice and, and kind of other resources that you have. Sure. Our, our website is restoremotion.com. And as I said earlier, we have that list of events, you know, the, uh, the free workshops that we hold via Zoom. Um, you're welcome to um, email us um, either at info at restoremotion.com and Reshma's uh, email as well as my email is there with our bios too. So you can get a hold of us that way. Look forward to helping anybody who needs help with this. And, and you do general physical therapy as well. I mean, you don't do only pelvic physical therapy. Is, is, would you can say um, maybe just to get an idea um, what percentage of your practice is more say pelvic floor you know, versus general? say we're probably at least 60 percent or more pelvic health yeah but, but it's again, all connected pelvis is, it's all time. connected yeah so i just exactly. want to make sure and just identify that sometimes that if you're coming in with the pelvic floor issue we may be treating your back or your shoulder because we feel like it might be connected to your pelvic floor issue or if you come in with your shoulder or neck issue or a jaw issue we're thinking mm, there might be a situation with your pelvic floor let's go there right so you know, so it just really depends. It's going back to the holistic approach. Right. Um, so we're treating anything from like toe pain to headaches, essentially. Yeah, yeah it kind of reminds me of acupuncture. It's like if someone's coming in with uh, pelvic pain, but it's like, why are you putting this needle in my ear or something, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like it's all, it's all <laughs> exactly. connected. Exactly. Yes. Well, thank yeah. you both um, for coming on, Miriam Reshma. It's great to see you. Great to reconnect yeah, to here. You. And um, thank you for sharing yeah. with the listeners the importance of pelvic floor uh, therapy and, you know, function and um, looking forward to uh, really uh, learning more about this over time. You know, it's something that I think has been kind of hidden for a long time or not really recognized. And I think more people, like you said, are starting to know, notice the benefits from uh, public care therapy and why it's so important. Yeah, thank you so much for asking us and thinking of us. Absolutely. Exactly. Enjoy the rest of your summer. Well, best we'll to you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for taking the time to listen to us today. If you enjoyed this conversation, please take a moment to leave us a review. It helps our podcast to reach more listeners. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss our next episodes and conversations. And thank you so much again for being with us.